This episode of the Modern Therapist Survival Guide is brought to you by the Therapy Reimagined Conference. What? October 18th and 19th in Universal City, California. Hang out with all of the cool modern therapists. Yes, we are sponsoring our own podcast because we are so excited about the conference. And if you listen at the end of the episode, we'll get you a promo code for a nice discount. You're listening to the Modern Therapist Survival Guide, where therapists live, breathe, and practice as human beings. To support you as a whole person and a therapist, here are your hosts, Kurt Widhelm and Katie Vernoy. Welcome back, Modern Therapists. This is the Modern Therapist Survival Guide. I'm Kurt Widhelm with Katie Vernoy. And if a therapist is walking alone without any friends, who complains to them in their off time? <laughs> If a friend doesn't have a therapist around, do they still complain? So today's episode, we are going to talk about the off-duty therapy that we tend to do in this field, whether it's to our family, to our friends, the lines in between when those people actually need therapy versus when there are people in your life who are complaining and you're just a good listener and are too polite to say stop. <laughs> But really looking at kind of this extended life of the therapist and when we get off work and what we should do about it. And I know that I'm guilty of this, that there's a lot of days where I call my therapist friends on the way out of the office where it's just like, I need to vent to somebody who understands about my day. And I don't take into consideration whatsoever what kind of day you may or may not have, <laughs> but I have feelings about my day that, you know... My wife, who's very wonderful, listens to a lot of things, but just doesn't understand the nuances of mm -hmm. a day and just, you know, I need somebody to validate me on my way home. And Katie knows that I like to call people from my hands-free device uh, <laughs> in my car when I'm sitting in traffic. But, you know, there's, there is people, Katie being one of them, some of my other friends who are therapists, that this is just kind of my, like, I need to complain about my day. And it helps me by the time I get to my house off the 405 and you know that's sometimes several hours in traffic but just being able to vent that out helps me out but sometimes and a lot of times i think most of us are on the other end of that conversation that phone call of our friends reaching out to us and just kind of venting to us because they have feelings about things and how do you handle this well i have to handle it a lot because you call me a lot <laughs> Sometimes I have to get sneaky with my phone calls to you where it's like, hey, here's some business stuff or a podcast idea. While well, I've got you, let me, <laughs> let me tell you about my day. Yes, yes. So I think the first thing that I do is try to identify what my role is because there are folks who I have more of a, I don't know if the right word is mentor role, but people who are consistently seeking my feedback and support. There are people who I'm in deeper relationships with who are kind of friendly Friend, re friend relationships, friendly relationships, or there's folks who just want kind of free therapy or free consultation. And so depending on the role, I will either try to set a limit and do all of the things that therapists don't do, which is closed questions and, you know, yes, no questions. So now you're going to know what I'm doing when you call on the phone on the way home from work. <laughs> but I will do like closed questions. I'll, I'll put a time limit, whether it's real or created. Like, oh, hey, I've only got a couple of minutes. What's going on? Sounds like that's really hard. Oh, man, that sucks. Okay, thanks. Bye. But I think the biggest piece is really identifying who am I talking to and, and what role do I want to play? Because I think for some folks, I can kind of verge into not total therapist, but resource. And so I, you know, recently I had a friend come over and she was like, I didn't want to do this, but I'm just really depressed and I've got this going and that going on. And so I listened, I validated and I connected her to therapists. But were she to continue doing that, I would probably have to start setting those limits. And I think that that's a really important distinction of I'm more than happy for people in my life who one time need advice, need, you know, kind of mm -hmm. a perspective taking thing. But it's kind of that repeated aspect of it. Where yes. It's like, okay, this is too close for me to be your therapist. And I, I mm -hmm. think that that's, you know, that, that jump that you're describing to there. Yeah. 
it's also some people who can't take a hint that <laughs> they keep calling you even though you keep cutting them off and then they call you back. <laughs> I wouldn't know anything about that, but well, I'm, I'm bringing up like family members where, yes. you know, traditionally uh, a set of even semi-close siblings that would be talking about things going on in the family mm -hmm. or, uh, around even another family member's mental health issues and yes. dealing with that, that you do have to navigate because you might be paralleling your own feelings and processes around that and kind of sliding into this middle gray zone in between the two, that it's needing to be the appropriate level of family emotional support yeah, without necessarily using too much of your therapist directives but in cases where it's like maybe an elderly parent or grandparent who's going through dementia or some aspect of that where there might be an education piece that you know from your practice or from your studies that then enters into the conversation of well you know here's kind of the support that family members need is to talk about it with each other but you don't want to be the center of that conversation or a facilitator of the whole family of like okay now cousin bob you know how do you feel about it you're, you're pretty <laughs> silent about this <laughs> i think that's really true and i think for me even gets into specific tactics because i've actually had this conversation recently with one of my clients who is a a counselor and it was interesting it was a therapy client that was a counselor and talking with her about how to even increase the the empowerment or the the, the self-reliance of the people in her family saying don't immediately answer the phone you know set a day you know like later in the day so giving giving you know kind of the family members time to do some self-soothing and self-regulation giving the family members some space so it doesn't immediately go to I need to talk to Katie and tell her all of this stuff and sort it through and get all the the feedback and advice and support and kind of therapeutic interventions from Katie. Katie's not as available, but we'll still come in and, and do the conversation later when they're calmer, when they have, <laughs> when they've, they, when they've gotten some of their own resources. And I, I try to come from a place, like I said, as a resource, like these are the things that I see. You may want to check out this kind of stuff. And I, f I find that especially with my friends and family, a lot of my, you know, my siblings, my siblings-in-law, my really close friends, they all have kids and they start talking to me about my kids having this problem. What do I do about it? And so for me, it's kind of identifying, should, should you be worried about it? And, you know, I, I say like, you know, whether or not they should actually like seek therapy, if they should get some resources at the school. So I still go into that space because I feel like I have these tools and I don't want to not use them just because it's a therapist thing. But I, I'm not a kid's therapist. I'm not their kid's therapist. And so being able to say, hey, yeah, that's not normal. <laughs> These are the types of professionals you want to seek. I feel like that that helps because you're still really providing them with feedback and support. You're maybe giving that you're not immediately on the spot and giving them all of the self-soothing and all the self-regulation. You're 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 actually allowing them to take some space before they come to you and not being so available. Well, that brings up kind of a whole another point is I, I am a child and adolescent therapist mm -hmm. and have had people in my life, you know, with younger kids and be like, so does my kid have autism? <laughs> <laughs> and as, as far as I can remember in any of those conversations, it's pretty obvious that the kids are typically developing. And, yeah. and so it's just kind of one of those how much do I want to have this fight right now of here's where my professional boundaries are and just be like, you know, there's nothing that I see that is of concern right now. Yeah. What if there was like, and that's, you well, know, and I've, and I've had that experience and I think the way that I, the way that I've dealt with it and, and maybe you have a different tack, but I say, it's hard for me to tell because I've got a relationship with them. So I have my own emotions and feelings wrapped up into it. I do see these things and I would recommend this person to do an assessment. Which is, I think where most of us would prefer to go and be able to separate out some of that relationship mixture, the, the webs that develop mm -hmm. in, in all the different layers that are in that. But this does also lead into 
those friends and family members who legit have mental health needs or yeah. really legit need to go into therapy and to really be able to navigate some of those conversations mm-hmm. as far as, you know, some of this is also just my advice for my students, my supervisees at the end of our day when we're, you know, tired, when we've had our tough days is I encourage therapists when they have their friends calling and say, I need, I need an ear. My response is, is I've got about 70% that I can give you today. Like mm. you, you've brought up the, the spoons analogy before. <laughs> like this is, you know, a very similar version of that of like, I, I am at the end of a tough day. I can, I can give you a, mm-hmm, yeah, that sounds crazy. Or I can let you call me tomorrow when I'm a little bit more, yeah. um, but really being able to set a open boundary. It doesn't have to be a hard boundary. It doesn't have to be a soft boundary, but an open one as far as what you're capable of providing as a listener in your off time, whether it's as the friend, whether it's appropriate, Mm -hmm. but especially when it does become more severe in like, Hey, I, I can only listen so much on this, but what it sounds like is you need somebody to really listen to you and, and to make that very similar referral again. I think that's important. I think that even with our friends who don't have full on mental health diagnoses, like they're not actively suicidal, extremely depressed, super anxious. Like they're just kind of the subclinical stuff or, or whatever. Adjustment disorder, 43.20. Yes. Yes. Like they, they have some sort of adjustment issue or, or life transition or whatever, and they could use therapy. They might be helped by therapy, but they aren't necessarily act like if, if there's the, a the huge, worried well the worried well but i think if there's the like if they're truly in danger if they're truly suicidal and there's someone i care about i may step across the line to, to make them make sure they're safe mm-hmm. i may you know kind of do a safety plan with them i may contact people i may jump right in because and try to get them connected with resources but still until they are until they're safe or connected with the appropriate resources i may step across the line because i want i want my family members to live and I want them to thrive, right? But if it's like the worried well and they're calling you and they're and they're wanting advice and feedback, there is a point at which your need to be a therapist doesn't line up with what they're actually looking for. And so for me, it also is, what do you want here? Do you want me to listen and do the aha? Uh-huh? Do you want me to help you problem solve? Do you want me to just be like, man, that guy's an asshole, blah, blah, blah. Like, <laughs> I'm so glad to hear you say this because... <laughs> Several years ago, I met a therapist, and we became friends. Mm-hmm. And at the time that I met him, he was going through a divorce. Mm-hmm. And he, I don't know, I'd, I'd known him for a couple of weeks at this point, and he started complaining about the divorce process. And I did exactly that. I'm like, okay, I'm assuming that you've got your own therapist, and you've got a bunch of other therapists in your life. So can yeah. I take one of those other roles of just like... <laughs> And he's like, please, like, I need somebody else to just like validate the yeah. the anger feelings. And like, Done. Done. But-, but I think there's a lot of therapists that we get so far into perspective taking and the calm. How does that make you feel? And all of that stuff. And, and granted, I'm not typical in that way. I, I'm more direct regardless. But I think we have such great perspective taking. There's times when we perspective take the hell out of our relationships where we just irritate our friends and family because we don't just listen to them. <laughs> we try to help them gain perspective and process and and cope. And I don't know that they want that. And I will tell you the people in my life that have the hardest time with that right now, my kids. <laughs> <laughs> poor therapist kids. Poor therapist kids. Because I, I do want them to be emotionally intelligent and to perspective take, but sometimes kids just want to be in their feelings and hold Mm -hmm. on to them and have just their feelings validated. Mm -hmm. And especially when they're both like in trouble and arguing different sides (laughs) of the exact same thing. (laughs) They're like, I don't want to understand my sister. My brother is dumb. (laughs) More or less. (laughs) Yeah, I'm guilty. Yeah. Yeah, I think we all are. And I think to me, there's there's a piece, and maybe this is a bias, but there's a piece to this where it seems like if you can see the other perspective, if you can get to that calm place where everything makes sense and you can accept both positions or you can accept that this is the reality of the situation, that somehow it's help, more helpful. But I think there's actually 
this is a whole other conversation. But I think there's actually some damage that we do to ourselves if we don't fully express a feeling because we kind of are invalidating our own feelings and the feelings of the people around us if we don't say, yeah, that sucks. That's horrible. Yeah, I can see another perspective, but yeah, that sucks. Well, and I think because some of us, when we do get into those bigger feelings and we do have maybe an outburst or something, is that anybody else is like, well, you're a therapist. Why, 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 why aren't you handling your feelings in the mm. right way? Mm-hmm. Partially because that's one of the ways of handling feelings. Yeah, it's just to get really pissed. <laughs> and, you know, just because we're in this field doesn't mean that we have to not have feelings. It doesn't mean we have to see all sides because there's a certain level in there too where it taking that perspective goes against your principles. Like you end up losing what your principles are Mm. in seeing something from the other side when the other side may make no effort or have an inability to see things from your own side. Yeah. And I think, and we actually, I think we had this conversation with somebody at, at Ernesto's summit. I think if you don't, if you're unable or you don't attempt to try to ground yourself in your own perspective, I think you can start losing yourself and, and, and we had a conversation about this with another person around if you start that too early in your own development process, like if you become a therapist early in your kind of self-identity process, you may not get that experience of like, no, this is how I see it. <laughs> right. And as a supervisor and as an educator, it's important to understand developing therapists needing that as a growth mm-hmm. edge. Because if you don't kind of make that mistake of like overstepping on on the perspective taking, then you just kind of come across as a know-it-all young therapist. Mm. And <laughs> more seasoned therapists are going to bristle at that. So you heard Katie's just like knowing. <laughs> And you don't want to come across too strong. I mean, I'm I'm very opinionated. I hope that I'm also very fair in the deliverance of of my principles and my opinions around things in kind of being able to say, here's what I stand for. Mm-hmm. I, I can understand what this is. Or uh, if I'm working with a, a couple who's dissolving their marriage and being able to talk about the impact of what their co-parenting decisions might have on their children, that these are important things for me to have people consider as part of this process. And I think that that's something where if I was just getting into that perspective taking aspect that the kids might get forgotten because they're not even in the room. Mm, Yeah. Yeah. I think when we're not able to hold the human aspect of different perspectives and be able to, to kind of feel into our own experience, I think we can miss a lot. So now that we're way off of talking about friends and family, I want to bring this point back to friends and family is that we need to be able to express that perspective to our friends and family when they are complaining to us, when they are Mm -hmm. utilizing our time that, hey, you know, this is getting kind of into my job territory and this is why I'm going to maybe set a boundary right here is because I don't have the the professional capacity to treat you, nor do you want to be treated by me. Yeah. And this is why I think that you probably should go and talk to a professional. That sounds very, very professional to say that. (laughs) (laughs) What I say is I can't be your therapist and I, and I, you don't want me to be that and I don't want to be that. So I'm going to, if I cut you off, it's because you're acting like I'm your therapist. And with me and my friends, it's probably a little bit more to the point too. (laughs) Neither one of us wants me to be your therapist. Yeah. Well, I think it's with therapist friends, I think it's actually not as hard because you can, because there's an understanding of what that boundary is. I think for me, one of the first developmental things I had to do was to clarify that with my family members, because I think as we, one of the roles that we often play before we become therapists is like the parentified child or the therapist of the family. And so this is a role we've played with everyone in our lives. Then we get the training and then we have to stop doing it. And so I think there are those, especially for our, our early career, you know, modern therapists, it's like there are those conversations that have to shift because we're good at this. All our friends and family members have relied on us for this. 
And so we have to stop it. And so for me, it was it was very dramatic. I mean, extremely dramatic. It was like, I cannot be the therapist. This is going into that territory. I'm using some of your language. This needs to stop. And I think it it was very uncomfortable at first. Which as a family systems person, I would fully expect that a family system would try to rein back in somebody <laughs> who's trying to get out of it. Yeah. And, you know, this is part of where it's hard to give general advice to our general audience on this because each situation is going to be different. That mm -hmm. some people are just going to be helpless and get sucked right back into their own family system until they continue <laughs> to do their own work around things. Or in my situation, there are times when I feel like I set the boundary too far and I've got family members that are like, I didn't want to bring this to you because it's your job, but I'm really worried about my kid. I'm like, what? <laughs> right. And I think I'm also your sister. <laughs> And that's really where more my family boundaries ended up being set was mm -hmm. people just being afraid of, you know, bringing that kind of information to me. Yeah. And I think it, it is, it is something where I think it continues to evolve. It continues to, to shift. And so for me, I think I've found a good balance with my friends and family. I think I've found a good balance for myself. I think what ends up happening is when we are able to clarify what role we're playing, and the, with the different people in our lives, I think we can use our skills in a way that still feels in alignment with kind of the ethics of, of not creating a dual relationship, not providing therapy to friends and family and, and whatever colleagues. But I think there's still that kind of emotional piece. And I think we've talked about this, but I want to dig into it a little bit more is that when there's stuff going on with your family members, and even if you're not being like a therapist to them, or you're not being in that role of, of listener consistently, but when there's all that stuff going on around you, I think the difficulty that often comes up is that people will kind of pretend like they are a therapist. And I, I don't know if I'm saying this very well, but they'll pretend like they are a therapist and they're handling it all very well. And then don't necessarily, you know, kind of take care of themselves and it impacts their ability to do the work in the room because there's so much going on outside. So I don't know if I'm not, I'm not saying it well, but I think there's, there's that need to recognize that you are a human being that's interacting with all this stuff outside. People are relying on you more because of you being a therapist, whether you're setting those limits or not, like you're the one that becomes oftentimes the emotional hub for friends because you have that capacity. And so even if you've set good limits, even if the listening is, is on point, even if you've done all that stuff, there's still a lot coming at you. And I think people, the, at least the therapist I've talked to, they, they forget about that. And they don't necessarily do the extra self-care when there's a shooting or, or when there's a, you know, a crisis of some sort or their friends really pissed about something or whatever. Like they don't necessarily do the extra self-care because it, it feels like, well, I'm doing the right thing. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, there's all sorts of ways that this can come up into the room as far as that outside stuff goes. And, you know, uh, Shira Myro's episode on mental load is a mm -hmm. good yes, resource yes, exactly. on, on ways of handling some of this stuff, too. I was almost thinking you were going to go in a different direction with this. And mm -hmm. the direction that I thought you were going to go is the family or the friends that aren't dealing with their stuff mm -hmm. and your role as just kind of a person who knows things to be like, hey, you know what? It's okay to have feelings about this. And yeah. kind of... It, it's not necessarily, you know, stepping into that therapist role, but it's using some of those skills that is kind of the opposite end of this of like, Hey, I know you're not taking care of you. And here's some ways that you might want to do that. When you're able to do that, I think that can be very helpful. When you were saying that, I thought of another thing. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, are, this, is ju this is just us guessing what each other's thinking. From yes. And we're wrong, which is very interesting, but there are times when I have hit either compassion fatigue or especially when I was working in community mental health and I was dealing with like homelessness and poverty and all that stuff. And so I wasn't th the therapist for the people around me. I was the cynic. And I was like, you think that's bad? You are like, stop complaining, man. Like you could have a house. <laughs> <laughs> and so I think there's also that piece that can come up when you're not being the therapist for the people around you. So you can be completely insensitive to like their real struggles because you're like, yeah, that's not that bad. Yeah, and that is in that whole compassion fatigue burnout sort of end of things. And 
And a different type of perspective taking. It really is. <laughs> I remember being at a supervisor training of somebody who supervised almost exclusively in those types of settings and talking about that bias developing over time. Mm -hmm. of, and for this particular trainer, it was around SES. Of like, yeah. You know, well, you know, rich people don't have... <laughs> like, <laughs> rich people have no problems. <laughs> yes. Oh, that's, that's a first world problem. Yep, yep. And so I think it all is about coming back to assessing yourself, whether it's about how you set your relationships up, how you address kind of the emotional aspects of being that hub of emotional connectivity and making sure that you're not subjecting all of your friends to the comparisons <laughs> of the things that you're hearing. Cause you hear the worst stuff in the room oftentimes. So I think that the takeaway of all of this if I'm going to summarize the episode, if somehow you've just skipped to this part of the episode, <laughs> this is what you missed. Let your friends have feelings, but not too much. <laughs> and you can encourage them to have some as long as it doesn't go too far. Okay. <laughs> I'll take that. Uh, but handle things professionally and it's okay to set your boundaries around it. And when in doubt, this is when you seek out consultation and your own therapy and mm -hmm. talk to your own friends about it. And Except, uh, Kurt, you got to stop talking to me about all this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I actually do appreciate that we have what, that we're able to have that com those conversations. And I think we do have the ability to, uh, to make those, uh, boundaries clear. So I think that's good. Find your friends. Like I found Kurt. <laughs> So you can have those conversations and with other therapists. What I get out of this is insert yourself enough into somebody else's life that they <laughs> have no choice but to consider you a friend. So I'm not sure if there's anything that ends up in our show notes, but if there is, they end up in our website, mtsgpodcast.com. <laughs> and while you're there, check out the Therapy Reimagined Conference happening on October 18th and 19th Woo -woo. here in the Los Angeles area. Universal City, right across the street from Universal Studios. So Bring along your family. They can go and do stuff, and you can have fun with us and earn your CEs. Who it's being graciously handled by Simple Practice. So a big shout out to them. Woohoo! And until next time, I'm Kurt Woodhelm with Katie Vernoy. So just a reminder: we did sponsor this episode for you because as Therapy Reimagined 2019 is approaching, we want to make sure that you can join us, and so we've given you a promo code MTSG50, all caps, MTSG50, so that you can get $50 off your full conference admission. We'd love to have you there. Come join us out in the Los Angeles area for two days of CEs of all of the great content that we bring you on this podcast, but in person with some really cool people. We've been really fortunate to meet a lot of great speakers through this entire process, and we want to help you get all of your education. We have a great partnership with Simple Practice. They're providing CEs for wherever you may be in the U.S. and maybe even beyond. So come <laughs> hang out with us. Come learn with us. Come be a modern therapist with us. And once again, that's MTSG50 to get $50 off your full conference ticket. See you soon. Thank you for listening to the Modern Therapist Survival Guide. Learn more about who we are and what we do at mtsgpodcast.com. You can also join us on Facebook and Twitter. And please don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss any of our episodes. 